We have long dreamed of making Mars live again, and for that you will need a magnetosphere to keep its seas and sky. But could a few well-placed nukes really restart its spin? The Dream of a Living Mars Just a couple days ago we talked about whether humanity should go to Mars, and if so, when and why. Like many such questions, the answer depends as much on our values and priorities as on our technology. We can imagine countless futures, but each depends on the tools and ambition we bring with us. What we didn't dwell on then, though it's a favorite topic of ours here, is the idea of terraforming Mars. Of all the worlds in our solar system, only Mars and Venus seem to offer even a glimmer of hope for turning a dead planet into a living one. For as long as we've looked up at the red dot in the sky, people have dreamed of making it blue and green again. In science fiction, Mars is humanity's second home. A world we could warm, water, and teach to breathe, with enough will and ingenuity. Yet behind every vision of a living Mars lies one stubborn obstacle, the planet no longer has a magnetic field. Without that protective shield, the solar wind has spent billions of years stripping Mars's atmosphere, molecule by molecule. Even if we restored that atmosphere through artificial means, the same relentless erosion would begin again. Which naturally raises the question, could we restart Mars's magnetic field? Could we reignite the heart of the planet itself? And that's where the truly audacious ideas emerge, proposals to nuke Mars's core, using nuclear detonations to jumpstart its rotation, or rekindle the dynamo that once generated its magnetic field. It sounds like something straight out of a pulp science fiction magazine, but with new insights in the planet's interior, the question is no longer quite so easy to dismiss. But needless to say, I'm still going to. What we've learned about the Martian core. For most of the space age, Mars' interior was a mystery. We knew the red planet was smaller and cooler than Earth and that its magnetic field had faded billions of years ago, but the reason why remained uncertain. That changed with NASA's InSight mission, which landed in 2018 and spent nearly four years listening to the subtle tremors of Mars quakes. Those vibrations became the first true sonar map of another planet's interior, and what they revealed has rewritten our understanding of Mars. Beneath the surface lies not a simple ball of molten metal, but a layered, dynamic world. New seismic data now indicates that Mars possesses a solid inner core roughly 600 kilometers wide, smaller than expected but dense and compact, enclosed by a liquid outer core rich in iron, sulfur, and lighter elements. That inner core is about 18% of the planet's radius, while Earth is about 19%, and in both cases that solid core makes up less than 1% of the planet's total volume. But because Earth is so much larger, its inner core is still over 8 times the volume of Mars's. In some ways, that's a lesser issue though, because the outer core is what actually drives the magnetic dynamo. Earth's liquid outer core extends to roughly 3,480 kilometers from the center, about half the planet's radius, whereas Mars's liquid outer core likely reaches to 1,800 to 1,900 kilometers, or just over half of its smaller radius. In raw size, the Earth's outer core is roughly 10 times the value of Mars's and made of hotter, denser, and more vigorously convecting material. That difference is crucial. A planetary dynamo's strength depends not just on having molten conductive metal, but on how rapidly it moves and how large the circulating region is. A wider, faster spinning, and more massive body, like Earth, is naturally going to produce a stronger magnetic field. We need to be mindful of that when talking about restarting planetary dynamos, even if the Martian core were fully reawakened. Its smaller size and slower spin means it would never match Earth's magnetosphere in strength. Thankfully it's further from the Sun and thus doesn't need quite as strong of one, but ideally one much closer to Earth's would help. Continuing upward through the Martian geology, the mantle above isn't smooth or uniform. Instead it's lumpy, irregular, riddled with ancient scars, chunks of impactor material, and denser regions that never fully mixed. This patchwork mantle suggests Mars never developed the deep, global convection that Earth's plate tectonics used to stir heat from within. Instead, Mars' interior circulation has been sluggish for eons, slowly bleeding energy into space. These findings paint a far more complex picture than the old idea of a cold, dead world. Mars' heart hasn't stopped, it's just beating faintly. Residual heat still seeps upward from the core, and the planet may retain minor mantle activity. What ended its once vigorous dynamo wasn't a sudden freeze, but a slow zashin of motion, the quiet settling of a dying world running out of fuel. Speaking of fuel, there's still time to grab a drink and a snack to enjoy this episode, and why not enjoy that drink from one of the official SFIA coffee mugs, available using the QR code or the link in the episode description. Why Mars Lost Its Heartbeat 
On Earth, all magnetic fuel is powered by the dynamo effect, the motion of molten iron and nickel circulating the outer core. As the inner core slowly crystallizes, it releases both heat and lighter elements, setting up convection currents that act like a giant planetary generator. That constant motion produces the electromagnetic shield that wraps our world. Mars once had the same kind of internal engine. Billions of years ago its core churned, its magnetic field flourished, and the planet likely had a thicker atmosphere and flowing water. But over time, Mars cooled. Being smaller than Earth, it radiated heat away much faster, and without active plate tectonics to recycle the crust, its mantle became stagnant, an insulating blanket that trapped heat unevenly rather than channeling it. The result was a stratified core, with dense sulfur-rich layers settling near the center and lighter elements above them, suppressing the very convection that kept the dynamo alive. Once that circulation faltered, Mars's magnetic field faded and its atmosphere was left unprotected before the relentless solar wind. The red planet's heart did not shatter, it simply fell asleep. Restarting that dynamo would mean more than just adding heat. It would require restoring global convection in the outer core, a Herculean task involving the movement of molten metal across thousands of kilometers. That's why some have proposed the most radical option of all, detonating nuclear devices deep beneath the crust to short Mars's core back into motion. It's a wild idea, bordering on science fiction, but as new discoveries remind us, the Red Plant story is far from over. The Nuke the Core Concept The idea of nuking Mars's core is often misunderstood, and frequently mixed up with other nuclear terraforming proposals. We've previously discussed the notion of using nuclear explosions to release water and gases trapped in Mars' polar ice caps, and even there we found it was far from an optimal plan, though not entirely without merit. That kind of nuclear terraforming is modest in scale by comparison, the difference between using a flamethrower to evaporate a puddle and using it on a lake. Even when we shift from the surface detonations to the far grander idea of nuking the core, the plan is not to literally drop bombs down a shaft to the planet's center. No such holes exist, and even if they did, the core lies nearly 2,000 kilometers beneath the surface, utterly beyond our reach and again has a liquid layer between you and the core. In principle though, detonations deep within the crust or upper mantle could inject vast amounts of heat into the planet's interior, at least in theory. The hope would be this energy could unfreeze a stagnant layer, restoring circulation and rekindling the dynamo effect. Alternatively it might alter the internal pressure balance enough to change the way the core cools, helping convection restart naturally over geological timescales. It's a clever idea in principle, but it collides quickly with scale. The total energy output of all nuclear weapons ever built by humanity would be a rounding error compared to the energy already locked in Mars' interior. Even a global bombardment would barely scratch the thermal budget of a planet. And while we might imagine future fusion bombs or antimatter devices powerful enough to make a difference, the risk of destabilizing the mantle, creating massive volcanic upheavals, or even fracturing the crust is hard to ignore. Mars may not have tectonic plates like Earth, but it still has scars from massive impacts. Another catastrophic shockwave could just as easily make things worse. The Energy Problem To get a sense of the challenge, consider that Mars' outer core is about 1800 kilometers in radius, an immense reservoir of molten metal and dense alloys. To meaningfully heat or melt even a fraction of that region, say just 1%, would require on an order of 10 to 27 to 10 to 28 joules of energy. That's the equivalent to roughly 200 billion to 2 trillion megatons of TNT, or every nuclear weapon ever built detonated millions of times over. If we tried to deliver that energy steadily over a century instead of all at once, it would still demand a continuous power output of around 3 times 10 to the 17th to 3 times 10 to the 18th watts, hundreds of times greater than all of humanity's current global energy use. And even then, it wouldn't guarantee success. A planetary dynamo isn't reignited by raw heat alone, it requires sustained convection and compositional flow throughout the liquid outer core. A burst of heat from shallow nuclear detonations would dissipate long for it to reach the depths needed to stir Mars' metallic heart. Even if we somehow deliver that energy, it would rapidly dissipate through the mantle and radiate into space over the following millennia. Mars simply isn't large enough to hold on to heat efficiently, that's part of why it cooled so fast in the first place, but you could do maintenance blasts I suppose. In short, nuking the core is less of an engineering proposal and more of a metaphor for the sheer magnitude of energy we would need to manipulate a planet's interior. It's the same reason planetary scale terraforming remains such a distant dream, the scales involved dwarf anything we can do today. New Insights from Seismic Science Still, the question is not entirely academic. Every new discovery about Mars' core changed the way we think about its potential, 
The detection of a solid inner you know, core suggests the planet is further along in its thermal evolution than we thought, but also hints that its dynamo once functioned much like Earth's. That raises an intriguing possibility. Maybe the dynamo didn't die because the planet was too small, but because of a change in the composition of its core. Too much sulfur, for instance, can reduce the density contrast needed for convection. If future missions can confirm this, it might point toward chemical rather than purely thermal solutions for reawakening the field. The lumpy mantle structure found by InSight also matters. Those dense blobs of ancient impactor material may act as heat sinks, trapping energy that would otherwise reach the surface. If you could somehow redistribute that heat, perhaps through long-term geothermal management or deep drilling, it might keep Mars geologically active for longer. Alternative Ways to Reignite a Planet If nuclear detonations are impractical, could there be subtler methods to restore Mars's magnetic field? Well, a few ideas have been proposed, though not all of them are very subtle. Mass Drivers or Impacts Redirecting asteroids or comets to deliver kinetic energy to Mars could, in theory, help stir its interior, powerfully enough to make a difference, yet carefully enough to avoid total catastrophe. It is worth remembering that all terraforming is, by nature, destructive. Once you start adding air, water, and heat, you're going to trigger avalanches, floods, and quakes on a planetary scale. You are not just spray painting the planet blue and green, you're reshaping it from the ground up. Or in this case, from the core up. So we probably shouldn't worry too much about scuffing the surface, it's going to be transformed anyway. Still, no one should be living there while this is happening if time matters, as hard to overstate just how many comets and asteroids you would need to drop on a planet to give it seas and sky. Trying to alter its internal temperature and structure would demand far more energy still, on a scale that makes even the boldest engineering dreams look small, at least outside of SFIA. Artificial Dynamos One alternative would be to create a network of superconducting cables or orbital current loops around Mars, generating an artificial magnetosphere. This would not restart the core, but it could protect the atmosphere from the solar wind in much the same way. It's actually far easier and vastly lower in energy cost than trying to reignite the dynamo itself, and since it takes geological time for a planet to have its atmosphere removed by solar wind, the breakdown of a Lagrange magnetic deflector is not really a time-urgent issue to fix, you would have centuries before you see even a tiny change. We discussed this concept in our earlier episode giving Mars a magnetosphere and revisited again in our terraforming compendium earlier this year. Directed Energy Heating Another proposal is to use powerful space-based lasers or focused solar mirrors to heat specific regions of the crust or mantle over centuries, gradually increasing internal circulation. Earlier I mentioned that the total energy needed could, in theory, be delivered over about a century at a rate of between 300 and 3000 petawatts. That's actually more power than Earth receives from the Sun, about 174 petawatts, and even though Mars gets less sunlight overall, around 21 petawatts, its smaller surface area makes spreading that energy even trickier. So either the process takes much longer or we find a way to channel that energy deeper without overheating the surface. Some surface leakage is fine, Mars will likely need orbital mirrors anyway to warm it for habitability, but most of that energy must reach the mantle to matter. One might imagine using microwaves to blast energy beneath the surface, though they penetrate only a few meters. To reach deeper we'd have to shift to very low frequency radio waves, VLF or ELF, which might penetrate tens of kilometers at best, though not efficiently. Perhaps a better method would be to drill extremely deep shafts lined with materials transparent to the chosen wavelength then in them with absorptive layers capable of trapping and re-radiating heat at depth. Magnetic induction might also play a role, using oscillating magnetic fields to stir or heat conductive regions on the ground without direct contact. You can also use that sort of method to change a planet's day length, so if you want to adjust Mars to a 24 hour day rather than about 24 and a half, this is a good time to do it. The Ethics and the Long View Even if Mars is lifeless, the question remains, do we have the right, or perhaps the duty, to bring it back to life? Some would call a barren world fair game for terraforming, others would say even silence deserves preservation. If any native microbes ever existed and still linger below the surface, flooding the planet with heat and radiation could erase the last traces of an alien biosphere before we ever truly knew it, or done more gradually, let them perhaps thrive. The pull of a living Mars is hard to resist, it already mirrors so much of Earth, polar ice, vast canyons, and ancient volcanoes, that it feels halfway alive. Rekindling its magnetic heart might not just be an act of ambition, but of restoration, helping our world complete its unfinished story. In the broader view, Mars is only the beginning, 
The same science that teaches us how to model and manipulate a planet's interior could one day let us stabilize others, Venus, Mercury, or even drifting rogue worlds, then beyond a place like Alpha Centauri. To a civilization that endures long enough, reshaping planets may become routine maintenance, a way to keep the lights on in a cooling universe. Whether that future begins with Mars would depend not only on what we can do, but on what we should do. And for my part, what I think we should do, one day, is turn the red planet blue.